like to welcome you back to our study on the basics. Uh, this is our 11th part in this study. There is only one part left after this in this study. Uh, I didn't know when we started this study how many parts would be in it, but uh, I do now. I I've finished up the study and we will get to the last study soon. I'll put it up on YouTube as soon as I can. But this part, part 11, to me is really important. In the overall view, as we've been going through here, we've been talking about the need to, to build a foundation, uh, the foundation that holds the rest of the building firm. As we've mentioned, there have been many cultures, many societies, many uh, countries that have sprouted up, become uh, world powers, and then deteriorated and crumbled. And of course, to me, part of that is because their foundation wasn't well built. And of course, that's the reason why in each one of these studies, I've had a quote from one of the old Greek philosophers, because of course, you know, as the image on this first slide has always depicted the crumbling of Greece, we know that Greece wasn't the only one. There was Rome, there was Babylon. I could have had pictures from any one of them. But what I wanted was for us to constantly have this focus on the fact that there are cultures that have crumbled, but in those cultures, there were wise people who saw the flaws in the foundation. And if we can recognize those flaws and build a strong foundation, then we can have something that is enduring. It lasts forever. And so we have the, the quote here from Epicurus. It says, the just man is most free from disturbance, while the unjust is full of the utmost disturbance. And so, you know, I would ask uh, each one of us to look at our life. What is your life a picture of? Is your life full of disturbance or is your life full of tranquility and peace? Very important to know the answer to that question. But not just to know the answer to that question off the top of your head. Sometimes we have to look inside. Uh, as we will see in the course of this study, uh, the devil can convince us that living in the pit of depression in, and addiction is actually the good life. And many people are convinced that they're living the good life. And yet every day their lives are spiraling out of control uh, and misery and destruction. And so it's important that we can really examine well, and I hope that that's really going to be the focus of this study, that we can begin to examine because we need some help. Uh, in order for us to be able to have that firm foundation, we need some help in discerning. And so without that, let's continue on into our first slide. As always, we're starting in John 14, 6, and I think this has everything to do with what I've just been saying. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We need life. And I'm not just talking about, you know, as is obvious in this passage, it's also speaking about eternal life. We want eternal life, and that's great. But eternal life depends on life here. And that's important because what we're doing right now is we are building an eternal life. And if we are living in misery, if we are living in hopelessness, if we're living in depression and addiction, we do not want that for eternity. But what we leave this world with, that's the spirit that will be with us in, in the next world. So we need to prepare ourselves today. And so our lives today, if we're following God, should be full of life now. And it should be the kind of thing that we would say, I wish this could go on forever and never have an end, because that's exactly what we're talking about. Jesus is the truth. And of course, in this world where there's so many falsehoods, so many uh, lies, we need truth. And it is through truth that we can establish something that lasts forever. You can only build absolutes on absolutes. And so if you wanted to build, for instance, the ability, let's just take this for a moment, 
uh, mentally and say, as a scientist, I'm working on a chemical concentration that would give man eternal life. Uh, basically, you'll never die. You drink this, the, the potion of eternal youth, uh, as some movies uh, have done it, uh, eternal life, whatever it is, I have to build on truth. But essentially, that's what we're doing as Christians. We're looking for that potion for eternal life. But it has to be built on truth. It cannot ever be built on falsehoods. It cannot. If we're building our kingdom on falsehoods, it will not last. That's the point of all of this. So we need life in abundance. And to do that, we need truth. And we need to recognize truth, grasp hold of the truth, and hold on to it for all, for all we're worth. And that is the way that we can achieve this. This is what Jesus is talking about. And so when we do those things, as Jesus is saying, we have life abundantly, we hold, grasp firmly to the truth, then as it says in John 8, 32, we'll know the truth and the truth will set us free. We will have a greater understanding of this world, the world we live in, and how, how true everything in the scripture is. And while sometimes the language that the scripture uses, we don't understand entirely until we study more and understand more, but it's all based on absolute truths. And that's important because our study today is going to be about knowing spirits. And we can't know spirits if we don't know truth. It seems like they're kind of distanced because one is absolutes, science, biology, etc. The other is spiritual. No, no, no. It's all the same. If we have the right science, the right math, the right biology, we have an understanding to build and discern the spirits. So we started out this study uh, talking about on purpose the physical universe, the earth, the universe, the body health, the fingerprint of God on his creation, because we need to have confidence in God. We need to know that all of the physical here lends witness to God. That's important. From there, we went into what is true love, true mercy, being authentic, being a peacemaker, being long-suffering, having true faith. And today, we're going to continue on in knowing the spirits. This is not some kind of esoteric uh, thing that you have to learn. This is based on simple facts. Now, I'd like to start out with a story, uh, a story of one of my travels down here. We were up in the mountain going out to a place where we were going to be having a meeting. We stopped in on uh, a family that we were visiting with. They were uh, relatives to someone who was with me in the vehicle. And we were talking with this family. And of course, the, the head of the household of this family is actually a preacher in another church. And uh, he was, we were talking about the Holy Spirit. And of course, we were talking about how it manifests in religions. And, and I was trying to be as, as easy as I could with him, uh, not trying to attack him, tell him his church is wrong or any of that, just trying to be easy with him, finding those points in which we could connect. Uh, and as we were talking about it, you know, of course, I was mentioning that in the world, there's a lot of churches today where it seems like people have a really bad understanding of what the Holy Spirit is or what the effect is in the church. And of course, he made this strong statement about this meeting that he had in his own church. He said, you could feel the Spirit. And when he said that, of course, I didn't say anything, but mentally I was thinking and asking myself the question, what does he mean? What does it mean to feel the Spirit? Of course, I understood what he meant as the image on this slide represents a bunch of people with their hands up, probably very loud, probably very emotional, probably a lot of very specific music. All of these things tie together to create an environment that's a special. And it, that environment is special to capturing people. And so this is what most people look at when they feel the Spirit. And what we need to de decide and know, is this really feeling the Spirit? 
what is feeling the Spirit? What is it like to feel the Spirit? What should we expect? If we had a very powerful church service that we know the Spirit was present in, what would that look like? And that's very important because if we can't understand that, then we'll never be able to discern between truth and fiction. And we will constantly be second guessing ourselves because we'll be hearing all these things because everyone in this world has dreams, visions, and things of that nature, but not all of it's from God. And so if we're always listening to everyone's dreams and visions and we're always taking them to heart, what if it's true? How do you live life? You can't live life. You can't live life because you never know what to do because all of these things contradict each other. And all of these things don't fit Scripture. And that's important. God wants us to have a stable life. God wants us to have a life where we can do what's good and right. Uh, that only exists when we have truth. And so I want to explore through several different stories in the Scriptures, uh, in this study, what it means to be able to understand the Holy Spirit, how God works with us, what we should expect. And when we understand that, it's vitally necessary that we get rid of all the white noise. All this noise in the background that's leaving us confused and unable to act, we need to get rid of it because it's not helping us be who we need to be in Christ. So let's get in. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, if we think about this just for a moment, the latter part of this, we know that there are many spirits. We know that there are many prophecies. What happens to me as a believer is I, if I'm taking in all of these prophecies, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and rolling them around in my head, how am I to act? Which one of them am I going to follow? One would say, well, sort through them. Nah, there's a point where you've got so many prophecies, so many dreams and visions rolling around in your head, you can't act. You, you, are, you are frozen in spot and unable to act, even when you think you know what it is God wants you to do. And too many people have come to me with that very problem. They come to me and say, brother, I've had this dream. I believe it's from God. And I re respond with, do it. They can't. They absolutely cannot do it. Why can't they do it? Well, there's only two reasons. One, they don't believe their own words. They don't believe that it's really from God. Or two, there's so much confusion in their head that they don't know how to proceed. They don't know how to begin. So we need to test the spirits. And as we test the spirits, we need to remove from our life those things that are not uh, part of the Spirit of God so that we don't live in this constant state of confusion and frozenness. We've got to be up and about the Father's work. That's very important. And as we can see in the image, I have two pictures of apples here. One obviously is, you know, looks wonderful, ready to eat, ripe, uh, nutritious. The other, mm, not so much, looks like it's rotten. Probably has some bad spots in it. You can see on one side where it's facing the other apple, that darkness in the skin, probably rotten under the skin. That's what we need to be able to, to understand when we're talking about the spirit. We need to be able to test it and know which one of these do I want to feed myself? Which one of these do I want to be feeding my children? Which one of these do I want to be feeding my neighbors, friends, and family? You can't feed them both of them. You've got to choose. So Galatians 5, 22 through 26, this tells us about the fruits of the Spirit. Vital. Because in these words, we find the definition of how God operates with us. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Do we see this emotionally charged electric spirit that causes us to jump up and down in church and yell at the top of our lungs? <laughs> Probably not. 
that's not really the image I get out of these words. And that's important for us to be able to distinguish. It says, against such there is no law. And so when I have the Holy Spirit working in me, I can be a Christian anywhere in this world. It doesn't matter where I am. Verse 24, and they that are Christ have what? They've crucified the flesh with what? The affections and the lusts. So one of the first things we should know, if it's not the Holy Spirit, it's going to work on our affections and our lusts. It's going to work on our emotions. It's going to work on our psyche. It's going to work on the lust that we have in the flesh. What are our lusts? Well, you know, natural man has lust for money, riches, sex, power, you name it. All kinds of things like that. So if whatever I'm listening to is working on the lust of the flesh, then that's not God. That's an easy one. We can just wipe it out right there. And so next, it says, if we live in the Spirit, let's, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we're living in the Spirit of God, let's stay there. That's a path. In the path of God, in the spiritual path of God, there are not lies. There are not false prophecies. There's not all this white noise. So what it's telling us is as we narrow down our life to walking in the path of the Spirit, this other stuff is going to disappear, and it should. It really should. I know it's easy to want to believe that everyone in this world uh, who says they're a Christian is a Christian, and if they say they've got a dream or a prophecy, well, we should take it seriously and listen to it. Not true. You need to understand that. You will live a messed up life and never be able to do anything for God if you live that way. You've got to focus. You've got to get into the Spirit of God. It says, number uh, verse 26, let us not be desirous of vainglory. When God speaks to us, the Holy Spirit's not lifting me up or you up. It's not lifting up the person. It's lifting up God. The focus should always be on God. It's not provoking one another. It's not combative in between uh, our brothers and sisters, but rather it's to lift up our brothers and sisters with the truth. And it's not about envying one another. If whatever is happening is causing me to envy others, if a sister or a brother stands up in church and gives a prophecy and it's causing in me to be envious, there's some problems here. And so this is laying out the way in which we can begin to discern between these two apples that we have here, the one that's good to eat and the one that's not so good to eat. One is full of health, vitamins, and richness that gives us life, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The other is full of the flesh. It's full of lust. It's full of provoking one another. It's full of vain glory. It's full of envy. And so we don't want that one. We don't even want to put it in our being because it will affect us. I guarantee you, you eat just a little bit of food that has food poisoning in it, you will be in trouble. Don't do it. Don't test yourself. Don't say, well, it's just a little bit of food poisoning. I can handle it. Don't do it. I'm telling you, you will pay a price you're not willing to pay. And that's important. So we need to test the spirits. And when it tells us to test the spirits, it's telling us something important. Number one, there's many spirits. Number two, they can be tested. That's positive. If I can test them, then there's hope. So we're going to get into, as I said, a couple stories here that are going to help us, I hope, be able to discern a little bit more about the spirits so that we can start removing all of the other noise out of our life and start getting really in touch with God, knowing what his plan is and finding real life. First Kings chapter 18, we're going to read 17 through 39. This is our first story. And it came to pass that when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubled Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed after Balaam. Remember the quote in the first, very, very first slide of this study, uh, the 11th part from Epicurus. And he said, the just man is not troubled, but the unjust man is always troubled. And so here we have Ahab. Where does he fall? Is he the just man or the unjust man? And this is important for our own lives. 
Is your life troubled or are you not troubled? Is your life in peace? Ahab comes to Elijah and says, my life's in trouble. You're at fault. And so often we want to put the fault on others. But Epicurus knew it starts inside. I've got to examine myself because that's what Ahab's not willing to do. But inside of us is where the problems begin. That's what Elijah's saying. You have forsaken the commandments of God. And so when we're troubled, oftentimes it's because we're not obeying. And so we need to start obeying. That way we get out of trouble. Verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all of Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Very interesting to me in this passage. Of course, we have Elijah on one hand, a real prophet of God, a real minister of God. Now, if we remember for a moment, just, just so we don't get off uh, kilter here, the, all the people involved in this story are the house of Israel. That's important to remember. They represent comparatively the church in a sense. So it's as if the whole church is here. In the church, there's one group being governed by this one prophet, Elijah. Now, there are two other groups in the church that have divided themselves off. One is following Baal. When it says 450 here, it's not talking about membership. It's talking about priesthood. They have 450 priests dedicated to Baal in their sect. There's another sect in the church with 400 priests dedicated to the groves, to Asher. And then there's this little, little bitty sect in the church with one guy, Elijah, governing it. This is important because the church has fractured. Okay, now... If we think about it in human terms, uh, of course, we just got done reading about the fruits of the Spirit and the antithesis, the other side of that, which is uh, the lust of the flesh, the lifting up, the pride, arrogance. So if we were looking today at the church and we saw this fractured church and we've got this huge group following 450 ministers. We've got another huge group following 400 ministry. And we've got this little itty bitty group over on the side with just one man, one minister, one prophet. Who would you think is the right one? Does the multitude of people prove, in effect, they are true? That's an important question that you need to come to a, an understanding of. Because one of the difficulties we have in life today we see these mega churches with 10, 20, 30,000 members in one building, and we say, how can they be wrong? Well, that's a good question. And I hope when we're done with this, you'll have a keener insight in it. Let's continue. Verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? So he comes to the whole body of the church and says, you guys can't make up your mind. You've got three divisions here, the Baal worshipers, the Grove worshipers, and the Jehovah worshipers. When are you guys going to make up your mind? Just choose to follow the right one. That's harder sometimes than it seems. And I know that because in our own church, in our own body, sometimes we do have some of this fracturing and sometimes we begin to justify. Well, but in all three of those is the Holy Spirit. In all three of them, they're Christian. And we know all three of these were the house of Israel. But not all three of them were going to heaven. Even though they were all part of the church, the real church. And all of them were religious. That did not mean they were all going to be saved at all important to remember that. Let's continue. Verse 21 again, let's start over. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And that would be to me one of those moments, you know, where it would have been easy to shout out an amen, so to speak. Uh, but what do we get? Nothing. Silence. No one answers. Well, that seems like a weird 
circumstance. It seems so easy for people to answer this. They didn't answer. And, and really at the core of this, they don't want to answer because they know the answer. But they don't want to say the right answer because for us to confess the right answer is to condemn ourselves where we are in our state of religi religiosity. And, that, and that's terrible. Sometimes the truth is too harsh. We do not want to admit it because it condemns us. And so we're silent. And that's sad. Let's continue our story. Then said Elijah to the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So he gives them this comparison. If, if numbers are what matters to you, let's go with Baal. If the truth is what matters with you, come with me. Just one guy, that's it. But they have 450. You make the choice. Let's continue. Verse 23, let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress out the bullock, lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. So we're going to do a test. And this test we're going to see again with another person. Uh, not so much, but we're going to see more the consequences of the test, the fallout of it. But here we have this test coming. Uh, if they are truly God, let them show God at work in them. If not, <coughs> sorry, if not, then let's put off all of this garbage that isn't God because carrying around all the baggage isn't good for us. So let's put this test before us. Verse 24, and call ye on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, hmm, amen, it's well spoken. And so now they got a test, and who's going to believe that Elijah has any more power to call down fire from heaven than 850 false prophets? Hmm. The, with 850 false prophets, you know there's got to be some trick up they can put up their sleeve to get that fire going. Whether it's, you know, who knows what, but there's got to be a trick. Elijah's just one man. This is going to be an easy peasy win. Verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves. He gives them first choice. Dress it first. He gives them first choice to, to get up and prove their gods true. For ye are many, and call in the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. Only criteria. Your gods got to make it. Again, with that many false priests, I would have thought that they could have figured some way to light that fire and prove to the people that their god was true. Verse 26. And they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from the morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made. And I think this is really critical because you begin to see the distinction between the man of God and the false ministry. On one side, it's beginning to paint a picture. Of course, they're willing to call on Baal. That seems like an obvious one to me, that that's not God. But we also know that when we get into the understanding of the word Baal, uh, it paints a more muddled picture for us. These people are calling on a deity. They're calling on God. Whether you call him Jesus Christ, whether you call him Allah, whether you call him, you know, whatever you want to call him, the idea for many people today is it's still God. And so this is the muddled position that they're in. They're calling on God. And that's what the people are saying. They're calling on God just the same. Me, I look at it and say, this is a no-brainer. But that's not the way everyone looks at it. So they call they call, they call, they yell, they jump, they dance around, they wave their hands in the air. And what happens? Verse 27, and it comes to pass at noon that Elijah begins to mock them. They're dancing, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're doing all the theatrics that should have called down any God if there was one up there to listen to them. No answer. And so Elijah begins to mock them, cry louder. 
Obviously, you're not yelling loud enough. Your screams are not loud enough. Find a way to yell louder. Cry louder, for he's, he is a God. He's either talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. He begins to mock them because their God's never answering with the right answers. And this is so important today because as more and more world events begin to happen, we keep hearing more and more prophecies from churches all around us. And if we listen to them over and over and over again, the prophecies fall through. They're not true. And that's important for us to remember. So we've got to set aside that stuff and look for the truth. That's what's happening in this situation. These people are on emotional high, but Elijah, he's on a different planet entirely. Let's continue. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And, you know, we read this passage and say, how in the world could anyone resort to this? Well, I, I just want you to know, this is not anything that's disappeared and vanished. It's not just Old Testament words. There are groups today, you have a picture on your screen here. Yes, it's a little bit gruesome. This whole event would have been gruesome to watch. And there was Elijah. There was the whole of the church, the house of Israel, watching it. It would have been very gruesome. These guys cutting themselves, blood everywhere, and they still can't get their God to answer them. That still is taking place today. It hasn't stopped. Verse 29, And it came to pass, when midday was past, they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Interesting, just wildly interesting. They've done all of these theatrics and nothing's happened. And I think about that. Uh, I was talking with uh, a brother in the church not too long ago uh, into the COVID pandemic a bit. And of course he was talking about, we were talking about you know what was happening and we were talking a little bit about false priests, false prophets and things of that nature. And he brought up the name of a very famous uh, preacher in Central America, uh, renowned, world renowned for his ability to heal all the sick. And he's constantly doing this. I'm not going to name who this guy is or anything like that. Uh, you know, just take it for the story that it is. He has a great ministry healing all these sick. He's very wealthy uh, as a preacher. And this brother said, you know, I used to think that this preacher was a man of God with all the people he's healing. But then this COVID pandemic came and he's been hiding in his mansion ever since. If he was truly healing the sick, why doesn't he come out and pray for all the sick? And it was dawning on him. This is all theatrics. That's all it is. It is to grab the heart and soul of people and take them for a ride. And that's why we have to prove the spirits, because we don't want to be on that ride. We want to be in the truth. And so Elijah said to unto the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. First thing Elijah does to me is probably the most important in this whole passage. He rebuilds the truth. The truth was tore down. The altar was tore down. He rebuilds it. He doesn't bring in something modern. This is important because we live in an age where, you know, really it's, it's been eternal, this cycle. But, you know, I think about it from my own perspective as there are young people coming up into the church and, you know, they like to, to refer to a lot of things in the church as the way of the dinosaurs or, you know, this antiquated way of doing things. And they want to modernize the church. We need to be very careful. Elijah is rebuilding the way of dinosaurs, so to speak. He is re rebuilding that path that has existed from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve up to now. Yeah, that's an ancient path. And I think about, every time I think about this, I think about the song we have, Faith of Our Fathers. This is a path that's handed down generation to generation, and we maintain it, we rebuild it, we repair it, we keep it, we preserve it. We do not modernize it. We do not change it for something that we think is better. We maintain what God has given us. 
And then Elijah steps in, he takes 12 stones. And that to me is also very important because it's symbolic. He's bringing in all of the house, all of the things of God. He's not rejecting any of it, even though at this moment, the house of God is AWOL. But he is bringing all of it in symbolically, all 12 stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as wood contained two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, he cut the bullock in pieces, he laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels of water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time, and they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time, and they did it the third time. And the water ran around the altar, filled the trench also with water. He didn't want anyone saying Elijah had up his sleeve a couple rocks. He was hitting them together, causing sparks. The wood was dry. It caught fire, etc., etc. He didn't want anyone to say that he was using any tricks. Even though he left the other team open, basically, to do whatever, and they couldn't do anything. He wants people to understand he's not doing any tricks. There's nothing up his sleeve. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, another very important point, tradition. Sometimes we want to set aside tradition. Sometimes we ask why. Why, you know, for instance, in the Church of Christ, the vast majority of locals celebrate uh, the sacrament the first Sunday of the month. Why? Is it a commandment? No, absolutely not. You can celebrate it the second Sunday. You can celebrate it the third Sunday. You can celebrate it the last Sunday. It doesn't really matter which Sunday you celebrate it, but tradition is important. So whichever Sunday you're going to celebrate it, celebrate it and stick to it. Why? Because chaos is not God. If we don't know when the next sacrament service is going to be, if it's purely chaotic and random, then that's not the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is talking about. He's rebuilding the truth and he's holding to tradition. Traditions are important. Now, obviously, we can have traditions of the world, traditions of men, etc., etc. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the traditions of God. He upholds them. And then it says that Elijah the prophet came near and he said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel. He calls in the witnesses. Because what he's doing is not unique to Elijah. He's not holding himself up and saying, look, I just got this new manifestation, this new revelation. This is going to blow the church away. No, he's holding up the traditions and the witnesses of times past. This is what Abraham did. This is what Isaac did. This is what Israel did, Jacob. And this is what I'm doing. We are a mass of people who have held this forever. And so he stands before the people, evoking the witnesses. He says, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Again, another extremely important piece in this story. Why did he call on Ahab to do this test in the first place? Well, one could say he had a little bit of arrogance. You know, maybe he was fairly certain that he could pull off the stunt and convince the people that he's the true prophet and the rest are not. No, no arrogance here. This was not uh, Elijah's choice. It says God told him to do this. And so when he evokes the witnesses of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when he comes and said, this is not something I chose to do, but something that you have told me to do, he's letting the people know this isn't me. This isn't about the church of Elijah. This is about God. Put your, put your eyes on him. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And we have this miraculous moment. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord he is the God, and miraculously everyone's converted, right? Well, hold that thought for a moment. Uh, I think we're going to find that probably not the case. What you have is a powerfully emotional moment. 
And oftentimes we can feel something emotional inside when we see something like this. And the people did. Of course, they had a lot of emotion about what the prophets of Baal were doing too. But here we have something entirely different. And there is oftentimes emotion with the power of God. But when we make decisions based solely on emotions, they're short-lived. And that is the case here. Remember, we're in 1 Kings chapter 18, where we're reading. Hold that thought. We're going to come back to it in a moment. But I'd like to just jump for a moment and see another example in the Book of Mormon, a man by the name of Korihor. And we're going to see some parallels here in, in everything that we've seen. Korihor was a preacher, uh, not of God. He was preaching a new gospel, a different gospel, a modern gospel, you might say. He was coming in with all uh, the theatrics, so to speak, and convincing thousands of people. But a test like the one we just read with Elijah was given to Korihor, and Korihor lost like the priests of Baal did, because you do not put God to test like that And if you're on the wrong side. And if you're on the right side, you don't put God to test unless God tells you to put him to test. Then you can put him to test. That's what Elijah did. And so here we have Korahor. He was put to the test and he lost. Let's read the consequences and what he says. And Korahor put forth his hand and wrote, saying, I know that I am dumb, for I cannot speak. And I know that nothing save it were the power of God could bring this upon me. Yea, and I always knew that there was a God. So his first confession is, I went AWOL, and I went AWOL voluntarily. I knew there was a God, but I preached against him. And so that's important because we can choose to walk away from God. It seems extraordinary. We have a good case of it right here. Now let's continue and see how this unfolds. Verse 67, but behold, the devil hath deceived me. He knew who it was who came and talked to him, but he appeared unto me in the form of an angel. And so the devil comes, puts himself in the form of a, an angel. Korahor has got some doubts about who this is that's coming and talking to him. But the devil appealed to his carnal nature. Let's read on. And he said unto me, Go and reclaim this people, for they have gone astray after an unknown God. Bring in the modern gospel. These guys are all AWOL. The whole country is AWOL. And of course, you can see a parallel right there between Elijah and Korahor. Uh, is Elijah coming in to save the people because they've all gone astray? No. There's a difference there. Elijah was not called to come in and save all the people. He was called to come in and do this test and show that the priests of Baal were false. And the test worked. And the priests were proven to be false. That's not exactly what Korahor is being told here. He's being told, you're the Messiah, save the people. And so Korahor comes in and begins to preach this new gospel, this new revelation. Verse 68, and he says unto them, there is no God. And so immediately the gospel changes. It's not like Elijah who comes and says, in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not evoking witnesses of the past. He's coming in and saying something new. Uh, what I have to say is going to blow you away. You never knew this. There's no God. This is what Cory Hor comes and says. Yea, and he taught me that which I should say, and I have taught his words, and I taught them because why? Why in the world would someone go around teaching false? Because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind. And that was the problem with the priests of Baal, the priests of uh, the, the Asher. That was the problem with all the house of God during that period of time. What they were looking for was the carnal mind. What did it tell us back in Galatians when we talked about this fruit of the Spirit? It says we have to crucify the carnal. Korahor is not crucifying the carnal. He's embracing it. It's pleasing to the carnal mind. When we begin to embrace the carnality of this world, we're in a very dangerous spot. Verse 69, And I taught them the words that he was told by his angel, even until I had much success. You know, you start converting 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Well, 
I gotta be saying the truth. Not this many people would follow a, a, a total blown out idiot. I taught them until I had much success in so much that I verily believed that they were true. He begins to convince himself. He knows the facts. He knows the truth, but he's now begun to convince himself that the lie is truth. And that's dangerous. Even until I have brought this great curse upon me. And of course, we know by this story of Korahor, there's no knowledge whether he was saved or not, even though he came to this point of repentance in his life and recognition of his error. But we don't actually know if he was saved. And this is the danger that so many people are living today. They're living knowing what they're saying. This modern religion, this modern idea, they're thinking it's God and it's not God. And they live dangerously. How does God speak to us? Well, we, let's call on the witnesses. Helaman 2.94. And it came to pass that when they heard this voice, this is the voice of God, and behold that it was not a voice of thunder, neither was it a voice of great tumultuous noise. There was no yelling, there was no screaming, there was no dancing, there was no all of this emotional excitement, but behold it was a still voice of perfect mildness, as if it had been a whisper. And it did pierce to the very soul. Such important words and profound ones. Important because when that voice pierces us to the soul, it makes us do something. You know, when you're in the world and you hear the gospel and you're finally convinced and the Holy Spirit really touches you, you ask for baptism. Why? Because the Spirit evokes a response out of you for the information you've gotten. That's the way the Spirit works. When we hear a dream or a vision, and this is emotionally uh, powerful, and it draws us in, and we believe it, but it never causes us to act, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's the devil. He operates on emotions, just like he did with Korahor, and works until you convince yourself the lie is the truth. That's not the way God works. When God speaks the truth, we know it's true. And we don't need anyone to convince us. We know it's true. And we respond to it. That's important. First Nephi chapter 5, verse 145 and 147, it says, Ye have seen an angel, and he has spoken unto you. Yea, ye have heard his voice from time to time. Nephi's talking to his brother Laman and Lemuel. And of course, they are going a well. They're going away from the gospel. And he's trying to call them back. 146, and he hath spoken unto you in what kind of a voice did God speak to them? In a still, small voice. That's the way God talks to us while we're still workable. Now, there comes a point where we've been rebellious for a long time. And then sometimes it takes a big event to wake us up. And typically we don't wake up. But Throughout all the course of his efforts to work with us, he comes to us in that still, small voice. But what did Nephi say? But ye were past feeling that ye would not feel his words. They wouldn't take the words. Too often, you know, when Elijah stood before the people and said, you know, we're going to do this test and see which God is uh, true and which God is false, what did it say? The people didn't say a word. Too often, we don't want to speak about the truth because it does cause us to need to change. And we don't want to have to change. We're happy where we are, stuck in the rut in our job, in where we live, our location, whatever it is, the church we go to, whatever it is, we're stuck there, we're happy, we're content. Like Korahor. Until all of a sudden the, the waking moment comes and it's too late. Verse 147, Wherefore he has spoken unto you like unto the voice of thunder, which did cause the earth to shake as if it were to divide asunder. And so they were deaf to God's word until the last moment came. Well, we know from the story of Nephi, if you read through the whole Book of Mormon, Laman and Lemuel did not ever, that we know of, come around to believe in God. And so the voice of thunder didn't change anything. He came first in that still small voice. Now, we started in Kings, and we're going to go back to Kings. Uh, we started with Elijah going up on the mountain with all the false prophets, uh, 450 of Baal, 450 false prophets uh, of Asher. In other words, 850 ministry 
that were over the house of Israel, the church, one prophet of God, Elijah. Okay, let's go back to Kings. We know the story. Uh, the prophets of Baal could not get their God to answer. Elijah called down fire from God that burnt up uh, the sacrifice. We know the end of the passage. What did it tell us? Everyone knelt down and said, Jehovah's God. That moment of total conversion, right? Uh, I said, hold that thought. And I'm sure there was someone who would probably come out and say, well, who are you to judge those people? Maybe they really did believe. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not here to judge them. But the story tells us something in a moment. It's going to tell us something that didn't show there. Oftentimes, we can be moved by emotion. And that's not the right way to follow God. We follow God because we want truth. Remember, the very first verse we read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those are the things we're searching for. Those are the things we want. And that's what we're actively pursuing. So, I've got a picture up here on the slide of a cave. Best as I can tell uh, in my Google searches and whatnot, this is a special cave. And it's a cave that's spoken of in Kings. And so we're going to go back to Kings because as this picture, which is a modern picture, was taken inside this cave looking out in the valley, I want you just to think about there's a, you know, just mentally put this in your thought. There's a man standing in this cave. His name is Elijah. And he's looking out. Let's go back to 1 Kings 19. Remember, we were in 18. We've got a progression here. In other words, he just finished this big display with all the false prophets. Of course, we know if you finish the story, he actually killed all the prophets of Baal. All the people went home, having said, Jehovah is God. We continue our story. Elijah, what does he do? He runs away. If all the people are converted, why do he run away? Why does he go and hide in a cave? That's peculiar. Let's read the story. Verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the words of the Lord came unto him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? So Elijah has this major event up on Mount Carmel with the sacrifices, finishes it, kills all the false prophets, and runs and hides in a cave. Very peculiar storyline. God comes up, knocks on the door of the, the cave and says, What are you doing here? What is Elijah doing there? Verse 10, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. And all those people that just got done saying, Jehovah is Lord, what are they out doing? And they seek my life to take it away. Hmm, interesting. So they weren't all converted at that moment. It didn't just change the world. Often when we convert by emotion, it doesn't. Often we're still stuck where we were. And that's what we're seeing here. These people had an emotional moment, but that was not a converting moment. The Spirit of God converts us, and He causes us to do good things, to change our life in a positive way. These people were not being converted in a positive way. They actually, when they bowed down and said Jehovah was God, it wasn't just because a spirit was converting them. It was because of fear of the fire. And that was an emotion. And that's dangerous to operate on pure emotions because we don't see clearly. So why is Elijah in the cave? Maybe a little bit of depression, a little bit of fear. Uh, not because he's trying to abandon God, but he feels alone in the world. He thinks he's the last man standing, so to speak. So, verse 11, God says, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Uh, in other words, he's saying, Come on outside, let's have a talk. It's high time we have a talk together. We need to get some stuff straightened out. And so God's going to talk, come and talk to Elijah. But Elijah's going to go out because he's going to talk to God for no other reason. So, and behold, it says in verse 11, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break to piece the rocks before the Lord. And so there's this huge, uh, violent windstorm outside. The very rocks are falling and, and trembling and uh, breaking apart. Is that God? 
Sometimes that's what we're looking for in a church service. We're looking for this violent moment. But it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. That wasn't the way God talks with us. After the wind, an earthquake, the whole mountain is trembling. You know, I think about that. So you have this violent moment. Elijah doesn't leave. He knows this isn't God. Now you have this earthquake. And of course, remember, he's in a cave. This whole cave can collapse on top of him. Uh, fear alone would be enough motivation to get me out of that cave. Uh, you know, how he stayed in the cave? Only because he had absolute faith in God. And he knew that God was not calling him out with the earthquake. It says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. 12, and after the earthquake, a fire. And, you know, I don't know how many churches do it, but here in Central America, there's a real big thing uh, in a lot of the, the, the Spanish-speaking churches. When they're speaking of the Holy Spirit and how the, the Spirit acts, they go on this rampage, fire, 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 and, and they're referring to how the Holy Spirit's supposed to be working. But it tells us here, but the Lord was not in the fire. This is a misunderstanding that they have, but they have this great emotional charged moment where they want to say it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not. It's not the Holy Spirit. That's what Elijah just told us. And after the fire was what? An emotionally charged electrical moment? No, a still, small voice. If you weren't listening, you would have missed it. If you were busy with the affairs of the world, if you were sweating under the toils and labor of your job, you might have missed it. A still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out. Elijah knew this voice. This was a voice that he recognized. He did not leave the cave out of fear or anything else. He recognized the voice of God and went out to speak with his master. He stood at the entrance of the cave and behold, the voice came and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeats himself. He says, I've been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, slain the prophets with the sword, and I even, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And so there's a bit of depression here. He's feeling alone in the world. And that's understandable. I would have. I would have major. But that doesn't make it right. And so God comes and talks to him. And when we're feeling down, when we're feeling depressed, what do we need? Do we need everyone to come around and give us a group hug, pat us on the back and say, cheer up? No. What we really need is we need to get busy doing God's work. That, I tell you, is the only answer that really gets us out of depression. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go. Get out of the cave. Quit sitting around moping. Go. There's work to be done. Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abelmehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And so there's work to be done, Elijah. You can't sit up here in the cave and mope around. And that's like us, if we're truly operating under the Holy Spirit, we can't just mope around. We can't just closet ourselves up. There's work to do. We've got to get out and do it. There's a world that needs the gospel and needs saved, and someone's got to take it. And if we sit around moping that we're the only one left to do it, it'll never get done. We've got to get out. And on top of this, says God, verse 17, And it shall come to pass that he that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And if that wasn't enough, Elijah, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. You're not alone. You're not the only person that believes in the truth and wants to sustain it. There are others out there. Have faith. Have courage. Do the work of God. I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees of which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. There are other believers, true believers out there. What are they doing? They're not bowing to Baal. They are rebuilding the altars. They are maintaining God's traditions. They're doing the good and the right. 
They are strengths and they're out there. Have courage. Follow God. 2 Corinthians 13.1 This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Again, this is part of trying the spirits. God will not just come to you like he did with Korahor. He will not just tell you all the solutions to save the world. He will come to his people in witnesses. Witnesses in the Testaments, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, there are witnesses in scriptures to what God's telling you. Witnesses in the fold of God. What did he tell Elijah? There's 7,000 more just like you. You're not alone. So don't think you are. There are other witnesses. Allow those witnesses to come forward and your witness. So God always has multiple witnesses and those witnesses come together and establish absolute truth. And that's what this is about because Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. For us to be on the right path, we have to be in pursuit of truth, not feelings and emotions. Feelings and emotions sometimes come with truth, but our pursuit is for truth. And when we find truth, we find life and we find liberty. That's the path. That's the way we want to go. So stop for a moment and consider all the thoughts and prophecies that you have rolling around in your head. Are they giving you liberty and freedom to act? Or are they keeping you muddled down in the abysmal, dark, dank cave of desperation? Think about it. Because God wants his people out and about doing his work, not our work. And so I hope this blesses you. I hope this causes a little bit of thinking, uh, provokes some thought in, in your heart. And I pray that God blesses you in your journey. Again, there's one more part to this study. Uh, I will put it up as soon as possible. And that will wrap up the study of the basics. And if we put this in our life, just like Elijah rebuilt the 12 stones, symbolically representing the house of Israel, we establish the foundation from the which we can build. Thank you for your time 